very excited to welcome my special guest for today's episode, Kurt Eichenwald. Kurt is a New York Times bestselling author, two-time Pulitzer finalist, and a former senior writer with the New York Times and Newsweek. His latest book is A Mind Unraveled, a memoir of living with intractable epilepsy. It is so riveting that I devoured it in one weekend, which is quite a feat considering, you know, well, I have kids. I have to admit that even coming from within the epilepsy world, I was taken aback by the medical and personal treatment he received over the years. Kurt is joining me today to discuss his book and his journey battling epilepsy. So thanks for sitting with me, Kurt. I have so many questions and things that I would love to get to, so we're just gonna dive right in. So many of the epilepsy stories out there revolve around children like my daughter who are disabled as a result of their seizures. But what so many people don't understand is that one in 26 people will be diagnosed uh, with epilepsy in their lifetime. And that means that they likely already know someone who has epilepsy. They just aren't public with their seizures. So your story is so effective in part because of how personal you are with the details. Why did you decide to share your history in this way? You know, there was a point in, in 2010 when um, a bunch of epilepsy organizations got together and they said their conclusion was if we're going to bring epilepsy out of the shadows, people of some prominence have to stop hiding. Mm -hmm. And um, they weren't particularly successful. And, uh, you know, athletes come out, but, you know, not a lot of people are going to be professional athletes. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in my circumstance, you know, I figure I'm not, I, I, I've got some level of fame, but I'm certainly, you know, not a professional athlete. And You're so, relatable. Yeah, basically. And when I was first diagnosed, the first instructions I got from my neurologist is, was don't tell anybody, keep it secret. Um, if you don't keep it secret, uh, horrible things will happen. And that got burned into my mind and it was a very, very horrible series of instructions. And you know, as I thought about this, I realized that you know, children, young people are getting that instruction from doctors, from family to this day. And um, the point of the book is to say, no, this is destructive and you can be open. And more importantly, um, you know, I've had so, some success in life and say, even if you are really sick, even if you have a significant number of seizures, you still can achieve what you want. You start your book, A Mind Unraveled, with your real life experience. You have had a seizure and wake from that seizure, become aware afterwards, and you are covered in snow. And I mean, it's, it's a, a terrifying moment to think about. Why did you choose to start your book with that experience? That night was the, has been the source of nightmares for much of my life. I mean, I... I I, I had made a very serious mistake. You know, I was living um, the way I wanted to live. And I guess this is another message. I was living the way I wanted to live at Swarthmore. I had gotten back into school. Um, and I guess I grew arrogant because I took a shortcut. I got off of the main path. At least this is, this is what I think happened. I don't really have a memory of how I got there, but clearly I was off the main path. Um, and I had, um, I had a seizure and uh, afterwards um, there was a blizzard. And by the time I woke up, I was buried in snow and my clothes were frozen and I couldn't tell where I was and I wasn't able to stand up. And, um, and I crawled through the snow. And when, um, when I started falling asleep, um, I found a way to stop it. I had, I had hurt my hand. And so I started scraping my hand across the ground to give pain to wake me up. I mean, it was nightmarish, but 
I wasn't going to let myself die that night. I had more stuff I wanted to accomplish. But I learned something very, very important, which was, you know, one of my roommates once said, stop trying to be superhuman. And that really was an important lesson. Just because I wanted to live a normal life with epilepsy didn't mean I had the luxury of being stupid. Um, getting off the main path when I knew I had, you know, convulsions, um, when I knew they could strike at any time, was stupid. Just like it would be stupid for me to have gone swimming, just like it would have been stupid for me uh, to drive a car. It was stupid. And there's, there's a difference between deciding to live your life, deciding not to let this interfere, and being in denial about the possible consequences of a stupid decision. Um, and so I'm much more attentive now to, even though now I'm not having convulsions, I'm still attentive to what could happen if I did. Okay. Uh, where am I? What, what am I surrounded by? Um, it, it got burned into my head over, a, you know, 15 years, I think, of, of no, 11 years of having, of having convulsions. And um, so that night, um, as horrible as it was, um, communicated two things in the book. And, and the most important one is never give up, but don't be stupid. That message to me um, it speaks volumes, that idea of, of never giving up. As I read your book, I kept getting reminded of the quote, in life, you don't get what you deserve, you get what you settle for. And when you were unfairly thrown out of college, you refused to settle. When unfairly treated in the workplace, you refused to settle. When given bad advice by your father and doctors, you eventually learned not to settle. You refused to settle for anything but a full and fulfilled life. How did you do that? <sighs> You know, I recognized that, you know, as far as we know, we have one life. And um, I could have stood back and said, I, this is hard. Mm -hmm. um, I can't keep doing this. And sometimes I did say that. Um, but, you know, ultimately, this was my only chance. And there was a point where um, I was in the hospital and I saw this elderly couple and they were just loving and wonderful. It was my roommate. Mm -hmm. And I thought that night, you know, why am I fighting so hard? What do I want? And I realized that, you know, their life was a, was a symbol of what I wanted. And for the next hour, I just visualized my life, I, I realized I wanted to be a newspaper reporter, I wanted to be married, I wanted to have children, I wanted to be a good dad and good husband. I mean, it was very, very detailed. And once I visualized that life, nothing was gonna stop me from getting there. And it, it, that was the thing, is to be able to have a goal, if you know the goal, um, and things get in the way, you have to knock them back you don't really have a choice unless you give up. And giving up goes back to the, we only have one life, mm -hmm. why give up? But that said, you did at times through all of that, you know, to, um, once you were starting to get control, you did settle for partial seizure control. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, due to, you know, difficulties and risk of changing meds. And um, so, what did you learn from that experience? Well, there's a difference between having the life you want based on those things you can control and trying 
to get control of what you can't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, life is divided up between what we control and what we don't. And, you know, seizures is, are one of the things I do not control. And so um, I go to the point where I achieve the medication balance, seizure balance that I am willing to live with that is, that is my balance. Well, and sort of to that extent, I would say, you know, that your, your story could be a textbook on patient advocacy. What advice would you give to someone? Um, how do they know when they found the right person? The key to finding um, a good neurologist, humility is the most important element. You know, the ability for a doctor to stand back and say, I don't know. Because the reality is, you know, this isn't like a broken bone. This is neurons somewhere in the brain that are damaged or malformed. They don't even know, they have theories, but they don't even know specifically why that happens, why if you go through you know, a clump of bad neurons, it sets the entire brain off. There, there is so much they don't know. And you know, a lot of neurologists were you know, the best in their class and saying, I don't know, was sort of beaten out of them. Um, every neurologist I have had from Dr. Narden forward uh, has been one who said, I don't know. Um, and there's also the importance of a neurologist telling the patient you're in control in terms of when we stop. Um, I had a neurologist who said the most important thing is we stop the seizures and that's not true. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is that I have the life I want to live and if we stop the seizures and I have so many side effects, well, I don't want that. And so, you know, it's my balance and the doctors who recognize it's my balance that they can't necessarily stop the seizures. Um, those doctors are the great ones. Just currently in our life with our daughter, we are um, that, that balance between seizure control and quality of life. We could mm -hmm. have seizure control tomorrow if we wanted to. She'd be in a coma because yeah. of all the meds that she would be on. And so it's, it's finding that balance and finding the doctor who will respect that balance and what the, the personal or the families, what their balance is, because it's gonna be different from person to person and family to family and sort of that partnership between the patient and the doctor and, and finding someone who's willing to treat together. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing you can, particularly for parents, if you look at your child and the child is, is, is all right, um, but when you up the medication or change the medication, they are, you know, zonked out mm -hmm. or they change who they are or in any way are living a life that isn't happy, um, go back to where you were. It, seizures themselves, you know, clearly are unpleasant. Um, having a miserable life is worse and the medication can cause you to have a miserable life if you don't recognize this is all about a balance. Mm -hmm. uh, what would it have meant to you if research had advanced sooner to provide you with better treatments earlier? Are there drugs that you're on now that weren't available before or different tests that, uh, that are available to patients now that, that weren't? Um, when you were initially diagnosed? Um, well, the answer to those both are yes. Uh, the drug I'm on now, I, d I don't even understand what this means, but my neurologist says this affects a different channel. It's like, <laughs> We've okay. heard that before too. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, okay, different. That means it does something that the others didn't. And so this drug is relatively new. Um, it did not exist when I was 18, and it's doing a really good job. But, you know, the most, when I look back at what would have made a difference for me, mm -hmm. the most important thing 
would be if people understood epilepsy. Um, you know, it's inter I could I could deal with the seizures. I could I could, you know, sort of accept them. But no matter how well I could deal with that, I couldn't deal with. Uh, I couldn't control how people reacted. Uh, I did get thrown out of school. I did get fired from a job um, and fired on my first day of work. I mean, you know, they learned about, they learned I had intractable epilepsy and um, within hours I was sent out of the office, never to, you know, supposedly never to return. Um, and you know, ultimately, those were the things um, that were so difficult. And the fact that back then, um, there really, there weren't organizations of the scope of Cure. And I felt very much alone. I felt very much like um, this is something that's me, mm -hmm. you know, um, and over time, I met people who also had epilepsy, but the, the solitude and dealing with the horrible reactions people had. Um, I mean, I needed, I needed a lawyer at one point when I was thrown out of school. Well, how do you find a lawyer? Well, now you go to the Epilepsy Foundation and you look at legal resources, you know, and you just start following that path. And so, um, in a way, I wish um, a lot of what exists now existed then. Um, but I'm okay. You know, I I have achieved the life as as bad as everything was. I have achieved the life I wanted to live. It's just amazing. I think one of the things that people get most surprised by when I say it is that if I could go back in time and push a button and make it that I never had epilepsy and I never went through these experiences, which, you know, were pretty horrible, um, I wouldn't do it. Because there's something about having a chronic health problem, particularly one that you know, for me was very serious for a long time. It, it reshapes your perception of life. It reshapes who do you want to be. You don't have the luxury of, of drifting through uh, and just sort of making decisions out of convenience. And so whenever, whenever um, when I think of my past, I think of my present. You know, my children wouldn't exist um, if I hadn't had epilepsy. I wouldn't be married to the woman I, a I am for complicated reasons. I wouldn't have the job I have. I wouldn't have the success in the job I have. I mean, you know, before I had epilepsy, I was thinking about becoming a lawyer simply because I couldn't think of what else to do. Um, and I would not you know, there's nothing wrong with being a lawyer, but I would not have been happy in that job. And so, you know, it, it's not a curse. It's just part of a life. And it can be, if you use it to learn about yourself, it can be part of a very good life. On behalf of the community, I can't you know, thank you enough for sharing your story. Is there, um, is there one piece in particular that you would like um, people to take away from this book? Epilepsy doesn't have to stop you. Epilepsy doesn't have to be the deciding factor of your life. Um, I was extremely sick and I didn't stop um, because I couldn't. Because I couldn't because I only had one life. And if your one life is about um, 
staying safe. That's the focus of your life. Um, don't drive in a car. Um, there, and I don't mean if you have epilepsy. I mean, I mean, don't ride in the passenger seat because lots of people die in car accidents. Sometimes we have to accept risks in our lives in order to live our lives. And um, that has to be the goal for parents with children with epilepsy and for anyone with epilepsy is live your life. Live your, it, it, it will be really hard at times. But other times it will be really glorious. You know, I have my kids talk about the fact that, because I did visualize when I was really sick, I did visualize children. And my kids talk about the fact that they feel so proud of the, of the fact that I fought so hard for the purpose of them existing. They understand that. That is a testament to living a life. We have to live a life. We cannot make this the center of our lives. And particularly, I, I, this message needs to be heard by parents because I know it's terrifying. I know it can be overwhelming. Um, but children have to live their life, uh, particularly when it's time for college. Um, and I just hope that, you know, that's one important message that um, I hope the book communicates. Thank you so much. Thank you. Again, Kurt Eichenwald's book, A Mind Unraveled. I cannot stress this enough. Go out, buy this book, download this book, read this book, share this book. This is a story that you can relate to whether you have epilepsy or not. It is a testament to what we can achieve uh, even when faced with the most dire of circumstances, what we can overcome and how they can shape us. It has been almost 40 years since Kurt began chronicling the challenges he faced in A Mind Unraveled. Despite technological advances and progress identifying the causes of epilepsy, one third of people still live with uncontrolled seizures. We still have so much further to go before we find a cure for epilepsy. That is why I am on the board of Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy, CURE, which is the leading non-governmental agency fully committed to funding epilepsy research. To help us find a cure, please donate to cureepilepsy.org.